All right, hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Gray Matters, the official, might I say, talk show of the Faculty of Science and Technology Guild Committee. My name is Romari Cohen, and I will be your main presenter slash host for the next few weeks of this series. So let's get right into what Grey Matters actually is. Grey Matters aims to tackle all the grey areas surrounding life, such as gender roles, traditional and cultural views, as well as provoking discussions among youth. The main topic of each episode will be centered around relatively topical areas, which also include aspects related to STEM and offers a nuanced or refreshed perspective. Every other week, we will invite various panelists who will engage in casual discussions with our main presenter, that being me. We will have special giveaways on every episode, and you will get a chance to join the conversation on Twitter or Instagram using the has hashtag FSD Grey Matters, as well as in the YouTube comment section. Okay, so today we'll be talking about women in STEM, and throughout the next few weeks, you can expect other topics such as privacy in the digital age, geography versus technology, water, wellness and cultural values, online politics, and modern superstitions. We are currently waiting on our other guest. Um, but for right now, let me just talk a little about um, my takes on women in STEM. So, Currently, I'm doing a degree in electronics and computer science. And ever since my first year at the UWI, the smartest people I have known are women, right? Even though they might not be the majority in my field, there are they always seem to be the best in that field. And I have no idea how is it that in such a uh, area in such a field where mostly men are taking up that field. It's the women who are always uh, who always seem to be the best and brightest. I remember when I just started in first year and I went in to my first couple classes and you know you look around all you can, all you can see are meals and you know that's what you expect. You expect to see meals in a field such as engineering. You know, so, I mean, I'm not going with any sort of stereotype at that point as to say, oh, I don't expect girls to be, you know, very good in this area. And I must say that, not necessarily that it was surprising, but it was quite different to not see that majority of the people who were doing well in the classes were women. It was surprising to see. Um, and it's not to say that males weren't doing well either. They were, but the consistency was always with with the women who were in the class. Um, my apologies about that. Um, yeah, so yeah, so currently we're still waiting on our guest. Um, in the meantime, let me just introduce who is supposed to be speaking. Yeah. All right, so today you should expect um, Dr. Gunshan Mangxing. Miss Daniel Mullings, Miss Rachel Mark, and Dr. Shereen James Williamson. Dr. Gunjan Mansing is a head of department and a senior lecturer at the Department of Computing and the University of the West Indies, Mona, Jamaica. Miss Daniel Mullings, Big Butt Prezi, Faculty of Science and Guild, Guild Committee President, UE Open Scholar, and has an interest in digital health. 
Dr. Shereen James Williamson, lecturer and museum curator in the Department of Geography and Geology, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Matters, and Ms. Rachel Pinnock, UTEC alumni, clean energy advocate and innovator. I don't know who is available now. Is Daniel on online? Your mic. Right, right, right. Hey, Romario. All right. Hi, Miss Mullings. Big Bud Prezi, what's up? <laughs> I'm good. This is a very good event. And I'm just happy to be here. So, of course, big moderator, feel free to start any questions or so on until our other um, guests come. All right. Um, you know, before I ask any questions, like, what's what's your take on 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 women in stem you know what drives your passion on, on right, being a woman a, in stem it's a good question um i think the same thing that drives women to be in stem is the same thing that drives men or anybody else really to be in stem you know is that love for maybe it's numbers in mathematics or coding or figuring out how systems work you know that's really where that genuine love and passion comes from <laughs> In terms of um, maybe why I chose to empower other women in STEM is because I noticed that there, there are less people, you know? And even if I look back at my journey, there are times when I remember going to a, a, a summer engineering camp when I was in fifth form. And there were only, I think, three girls overall in the entire summer camp. And the summer camp was at UA as well. And yeah. so, I remember, you know, you have to be like one girl per team for diversity purposes. <laughs> the moderate, the person, the coordinator was saying, you know, we have, have one girl in each team because we only have three girls here. And so each yeah. of us going to a different one. And I remember coding the robots so that the robots would go through the maze that they set for us. And the other guys, you know, the, the coordinators and those who are helping out are like, what? The girl is doing the coding? When there are four other guys in the group, they're like, why is, why is the girl doing the coding? Da, 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 going off. But I'm just like, you know? Like, and there are many times where I was also, yeah, what you say? No, I'm saying like, what, what that's supposed to mean? What do you mean? Exactly, exactly. exactly. What, do, what is that supposed to mean? So it's a vibe where it's almost like people kind of doubt you, you know? Um, and I even remember we had an architecture challenge. Yeah. We're supposed to use pasta to create a bridge. And um, I came up with the idea and said, yo, guys, you know, I think we should use these shapes because based on the lecture, they said these shapes were, you know, the strongest yeah. and so on. And the rest of the boys in the group, no, nah, mate, what may I say? But they might say, nah, nah, yeah. man, nah. And at the end of the day, the design that they ended up going with was, was the one that I was saying from the start. But it's yeah. when a guy suggested it, they were like, oh, yeah, man, that makes sense. And in my head, I'm like, I've been saying this from from four hours ago, three hours ago. You get what I'm saying? So yeah. really and truly, there's a lot of implicit biases and so on. And I think first, ultimately, person just doubt you from before you even begin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would love to try to relate more to you because you know, I'm, I'm a guy and I can't say that I've, I've um, had the same struggles, so to speak, mm. as, as women in STEM, but I don't know, it like, I'm not ashamed to say the brightest people I've ever known in a science class are always girls. Always girls. And then you come and then you come your way and you meet people like yourself. And you say it just raises raise the fact that yo, it seems like girls are gonna be taking over this field in the near future. It really it's seems a possibility. So. Yeah, it really seems so. And I mean, it's so strange to see the the whole things have changed in the last few decades because I look about 20 years ago. It was just men, 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 mm -hmm. you know, all this stuff doing up. And mm -hmm. we have women like yourself and the other panelists who are, you know, really, really making great strides for women in, in these fields. So, like, you know, t I want you to tell me how you would like encourage other girls who probably have an interest in this field, but you know, because of certain stereoty stereotypes, they're like, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to go into this, maybe so I do a whole dynamics or something. You know, like what would you say? So, so for, uh, for yeah. girls who are looking on and saying, boy, you know, they'd consider going into STEM, but they're not sure and so on and so forth. I think if you have an interest in it, go for it. And you don't have to go all the way at first. Just, you know, take the first step. Maybe going to 
watch some YouTube videos on quantum physics or you go and try a course online or maybe you go and reach out to somebody like me and say, you know, you're interested in being a software engineer. Um, right. Where do you think I should start? So I think mentorship actually, and as I put that there, mentorship is a huge part of it. So I had gotten a mentor through a program when I was in like lower six or upper six. She's amazing, Raquel Seville. Um, also a powerhouse woman in tech and in data. And so she would have, you know, opened doors for me, one. But two, I think the most important thing she did for me was to just be someone that believed in me and my ideas, you know? To be to say, Daniel, yes, I see you. I see your vision. I see where you're going. And I believe in where you're going. So mentorship, I would say, is a big, big, big deal. Like, seek out yeah. proper mentors that are going to inspire you and keep pushing you on your journey. Yeah, and you know, as I talk about mentors... You know, one of the things that um, I always hear, like great people say, kind of push them to where they are at now is having mentors. You know, having people you can look up to and say, I want to be like that person. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not, even if you don't personally know your mentor, right? There are people out there where you can say, oh, I watch these person's um, videos online or, or read their blogs or whatever. I'm motivated through that. And I think that works. And you know, I can personally say that there there are people out there where I don't know them, but you look at what they've done or what they're what they're doing now and say, yo, it really motivates you. I'm motivated to be like this person. Mm -hmm. You know, so I can understand what you're saying. And you know, for a lot of girls, it's hard, it's hard to kind of say, Oh, I want to go into this field. When they look around and they don't see a lot of women yeah. doing those things, you know, it's hard to say, okay, I'm gonna do it. And especially in in quote unquote country, Jamaica, you know, anywhere not Kingston, you know, a lot of you know the stereotypes of what women should be, you know, it really kind of, I think holds back a lot of people, a lot of women in those areas, because uh, uh, most of them are the years that all oh, if you just stay home. Man, the pit name, and that's that's it. Don't go out. Don't don't try to push anything. Great, you know, like, you know, just stay here, so we like it here. So you're comfortable here, so yeah, yeah. And you kind of just keep them back and pull them back from um actually accomplishing greater things. Um, but you know, speaking of that, and you mentioned this earlier, but I want to I want to I want to hear more about it. I feel like. That's one of the greatest things that affect a lot of women who are looking to go into STEM or who are in STEM. Okay, so what are some situations where, because of your gender, people kind of look down on you or they question your, uh, your authority and how do you deal with such situations? Okay, so the one I mentioned earlier about the, the summer engineering camp, I think would have been like the major ones so far here in Jamaica at least. Um, and yeah. in that situation, who I had responded was, you kind of have to keep pushing over and over. You can't push too much, or you can actually, right? There, there are different ways to approach it. Um, sometimes when you do get very pushy and you say, no man, this is the best way. I've been thinking about it and this is the best way. Persons will start to reflect and say, well, you know, she's a this or a that, or she's too forceful or da 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 da. There are many you know connotations that can come from that um but i think for me i've taken a mixed approach you know sometimes i will push and say well boy this is the best way to go and if you guys don't agree that's okay but i am going to continue on this route of doing it this way um and then we see where it goes from there but overall i think women kind of have to prove themselves over a period of time before they get that same respect that a man may have just off the bat just just starting from the get-go you get me? So if you let like, like them have to do more, then they have exactly. to do more. Exactly. So, all right, you can look at me, for example, right? When I first said I want to start off in coding or so on, what did I really take me seriously more than so? It's taken yeah. years of accolades and joining this and that for people to look on and say, yo, that girl is bad. That girl is going to stem for true. You get me? Where I get, whereas a guy can start off with maybe some little coding skills or have an idea or so on and can reach that kind of almost the same level of, um, you know, without having that well-built-out reputation over a period of time. It's easier to trust them when they say, 
I am a coder. I can do this or that. If a woman says she can cook, everybody believes her. You get me? So it's, it's, it's easier for somebody to believe you in that regard that if you say, yo, I, I can code. I can. I look at people like Naomi Benjamin, the girl, bad pun coding. Like, that's the next big programmer. You know what I'm saying? So there's so much talent within, you know, it don't matter if you're a female or a male. Like, it don't matter really and truly. The idea is how can we get people to just look at a person as a person? The person said I'm interested in STEM. Great. If they're not and they want to go into a different field, great as well. But don't yeah. doubt somebody just because uh, X or Y, you know? Yeah. Hey, all right. Would you, when, when, when feels with those situations, oh, <laughs> my good afternoon, Maya. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How's everybody? Um, we will, we will. We're doing well. I'm not sure if you caught um, the first couple of questions. Um, I, I did. But, um, let me just let me just throw one to you. Um, what what's your passion? What's what's driving you to really go after a field? Go go to to go in the field of STEM. STEM. Uh, yeah. well, thank you for that question. So, what I really love about STEM, and as particularly my department, is one that isn't as well known as the other ones. So I've noticed with STEM is that we love to push STEM, especially, you know, the government and other places like to say, yes, STEM, this is a very good thing. I want to develop it in our youth. But then sometimes we focus on a lot of the engineering and we focus on a lot of the computing. And I see where the science doesn't always get as much recognition. And so my role and what drives me is that when I came into UE, I didn't know that this area was something that I could even pursue. And then now that I'm in it, I'm like, why do more people not know that this is an area that they can pursue? And so what drives me is to make sure that there are more persons who are aware of all the career paths that are available to them and that know that there is a diversity there, especially young women to know that they don't just have to become a doctor. There's nothing wrong with becoming a doctor, but you don't always have to be a medical doctor. You can be a doctor of philosophy. You, I just want, persons to know that there is more than one way to do something and there's always another path and another outlet there for them yeah and what what are you what are you doing now um is it animal bio yes yeah. so i'm doing a major in animal biology yeah yeah i don't know i don't know i, I said this to daniel earlier i don't know if you're sure about the brightest people in this field that i've seen are always females all these are females and you know i really i really do believe that if more females were given the opportunity or were motivated mm -hmm. to go into this field um such as bio and computer science and engineering and stuff i i genuinely feel like they would be better than men not not here for no matter you know not here for no matter and i don't want to start a gender war but I genuinely, I genuinely believe that though. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you the question, Maya, that I asked Daniel earlier. Mm -hmm. So has there ever been any situation where your authority was questioned because of your agenda and how did you deal with that situation? Okay, um, so I think, yes, my, my authority has been questioned because I'm a woman. Um, yeah. I also think that big, the thing is that every woman has a different personality. I think that sometimes persons, um, especially when you're a woman in leadership, assume that they are able to kind of um, affect what you do. So I've noticed where as a leader, I have been the leader of a team and my team has men on there and the men feel as though they can more sway me or speak to me a certain way that I haven't seen to the, them speak to male leaders. And I always wondered why is that? And so in order for you know this, this situation to work, you have to just make it clear and communicate to persons that, hey, I am still your superior in this sense. That doesn't mean that I'm better than you that any other way. But if we're going to work as a team, you have to be willing to respect me and respect the authority that I hold in this position. And it's just a matter of setting boundaries in that particular relationship and just allowing persons to know that, hey, you know, I am a woman, yes, and I'm also, you know, a student and I'm also a leader and I'm also other things. And so it's allowing persons to, you know, essentially know what it is that you're about and, and how you are going to bring across whatever you need to accomplish, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, as a woman, 
right? I'm have, I'll access to to both of you. And you you you, you grew up in a country where you don't necessarily see a lot of women taking up leadership positions or going into STEM. Like at what what at what point in the life did you say, yo, I want to do this? Um Daniel, you can answer first. Um I think it's it's a case where personally for me I don't Am I on screen still? You can hear me? I'm not sure. I'm I'm not seeing you. I'm not sure what just happened. Uh oh. Uh, okay. okay. Um, yeah, so I was saying, I think it's a case where, for me at least, I I don't really perceive myself to be different from any other person, right? So when, so I know that the, the typical experience will be, boy, I don't see myself in certain spaces, so maybe I cannot be in those spaces. That's that's not how I view it. If I see anybody doing anything, my viewpoint has always been, boy, well, if they can do it, I can do it too. Yeah. So from as little, I've always been a leader, you know, I always come with new ideas. You can imagine me as a, a fourth grader in grade four saying, come to class and say, miss, I have this bright idea, you know, today is going to be book day or tomorrow is going to be book day. And each of us is going to bring a different book and then we'll read it on an exchange and we'll just keep going like that because there are 30 of us. If we keep exchanging, we could read books all year for 30, 30 days essentially. Yeah. Um, and you know, I've just always been that kind of person. So it's not a vibe where, for me at least, even though I may not see myself in the space, it doesn't yeah. mean that I think I'm not supposed to be in the space. I think on the international scene though, is the first time that I have been, you know, also thinking about things like race as well, or I've been thinking about all the different factors I think that um, will make me, uh, at the diversity metric, if you will, because I'm increasingly now in these, you know, these bigger tables in these bigger spaces, and I am just like, whoa! I am the only female person from the Caribbean, um, you know, black person, and the only young person in the room. And when I think yeah. about all of those together, I'm like, my goodness! That that's when I really think and say, boy. But I think growing up, though, it hasn't been, it hasn't been on my mind that much to say, boy, well. You know, I'm not seeing myself here, so I'm not going to be there. I've always been pushing, even computer science class in high school. The the teacher used to love to make jokes and say, you know, women can't code or so on. And he used to say it over and over and over. And it was a joke from him saying, he was saying, this is what they're going to tell you when you reach the international world. So you need to get used to it from now and, you know, start building up your defense. And I used to, I used to mm -hmm. take him on with it. Every time he says, I said, all right, sir. And he said, every code that I wrote, the end or the start of it, it flashes women can code across the screen. And my password was always women can code. The, the username is girls can code. You get me? So I was in his face. Over and over and over. Okay, okay. Every single program I wrote for that class, women can code just flashes across the screen at the start and end. So those are the two ways, you know? Resistance. You know, you know something where you say, when you just start, you say, um, how you used to go to your teacher and say, say something about books. I'm really, I think, go to myself and say, boy, you know what I say? If I did, but if if we did then at them time, then what I say, yo, wait, the person I'm not, you know, <laughs> person I'm not, wait, you really want to read, we could read book, mm -hmm. so, like, they weren't you approach like, that didn't people like view it, view, because when you're overly enthusiastic about, yeah. uh, like, really, when you're overly enthusiastic about things such as that, they're like, why want to that girl that she and nine, oh, why yeah. not you know, I can respond like that sometimes, but I, I think one of my skills is that I'm able to kind of garner that support very easily. Maybe it's my personality or people like this kind of enthusiasm that I bring or what. I'm not sure. But everybody was like, yeah, in fact, the teacher came in the class and the teacher was like, wait, why is everybody reading? And she was like, what's going on? I was like, Miss, I had this bright idea. And da, da, da. she was like, are you guys trying to trick me? Why, why everybody have a book right now? Like, are you yeah. guys okay? You know? So I've, I've had that skill in terms of being able to galvanize people and, you know, bring everybody together. Yeah. And I don't know, it's quite rare to, all right, would you, would you consider yourself naturally gifted or do you think you had to work hard over the years to achieve what you've had now? I think it's a mix. I do think I'm naturally gifted to an extent, um, but also I spend a lot of hours working on this. I probably spend more hours than the average person, but also because I probably have more focus or so on. 
than the average person. So there's that as well, right? So I can go with less of a work-life balance, so to speak. That wouldn't wouldn't that be kind of a gift too? That could be a gift too, yes. So <laughs> no, I'm just asking because like, you know, just knowing you based on what I know from you is like, there's not, a, there's not a lot of people who kind of have that many trophies in their, you know, imaginary trophy cabinet because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I look at you and I say, oh, you know, I'm going to do enough, enough things I'm going to do, you know, whether, whether it could notice or unnoticed enough things I'm going to do. And it's not quite often that you meet people like you where they have a certain level of charisma and a certain level of intellect, you know, you start to find someone, someone who has a mixture of both, especially in our society, in our society where no one expect it, expects it to come from a woman. True. You know what I'm saying? So, like, most of the time, people are saying, oh, it's going to be the men who are the most intellectual, True. men who are the most charismatic. And then you, know, you come along. I remember seeing you last year when you come running for guild elections, and I'm like, yo, I'm going to come with something different, you know? Something just different when I go there, you know? Um, I, I was gonna ask you a question, but I don't want. You have asked about gay elections, but me never ask. Now, me no, me no, me no want to spoil anything or anything, anything right now. Um, Maya, welcome back. Muted, I think, Maya. Maya. Yes, I was saying. I see you wanted to get problematic for a second. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't resist. <laughs> Yeah, welcome back, Maya. Mm -hmm. um, was, what, what, what did I just ask you, Daniel? Um, Are you talking about, um, do you, well, hmm. all right, well, the question we can go with from here, then maybe, Maya, is where do you see yourself going in the future? Like, what's your vision in STEM? Hmm, what's my vision in STEM? I have adapted a lifestyle where I try not to think too far ahead, but my nice. vision in STEM would be to create uh, i think i have a passion for sustainability and conservation and so i would love to see a sustainable jamaica and a jamaica that conserves and so i would love to put things in place to assist and help um you know the our country be better to help the people of the country be better and to help our earth because i think that in general with the issues that we face as a caribbean island we are the ones that are going to be most impacted by that's my dog by um changes that happen so i definitely think it's important for us to um basically be as women in stem to be the change that we can see in the world oh uh, wait my what's the name of your podcast again the name of my podcast is the real life podcast we haven't launched as yet but we're launching in february so you guys can look out for it and what it does is it tackles different issues that involve the environment um just like i was talking about conservation zoology botany everything you know i'm a life sciences girl so it's going to be about life sciences so it is real life topics being tackled by real life sciences scientists so you guys can look out for it yeah and you know that's that's really cool that you um that you're coming and you know you're taking up a, a an initiative to kind of spread awareness or to have discussions about um the environment and all these different issues good afternoon dr mansi good afternoon good afternoon everyone i see hi. daniel who i recognize uh, hi dr mansi well you don't know me you don't um, I, you know, I, I, I probably do if I see you on a bigger screen. I'm looking at you through my phone and you are like tiny image on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I don't you, you, um, you're from what department? Computing. I'm from Department of Computing. Oh. Well, I don't know. You never, I've never been to any of your lectures or anything. I don't know. You don't know. You don't He's know. in engineering, right? Ah, that's, um, can you introduce yourself from where? <laughs> Oh, um, um, my name is Romario Cohen. I study electronics and computer science. So I'm in okay. physics department and I do, uh, occasionally I have com sci courses, but I don't think I've ever been in your class. So you have not done first year, Romario? Yeah, I've done first year already. Comp 1126. No, no. No. Who, <laughs> I don't remember who taught me that course. He might have done the evening stream, Daniel. Right, right. Yes, the evening stream. I don't remember his name. My apologies, um, sir. I don't remember. Um, welcome, Dr. Mansing. 
Um, Welcome, Romario. So, um, I was asking, um, what uh, as a woman in STEM, what kind of what was what what drove your passion to pursue such a field? Ah, okay. Well, I you know my first degree was in physics, so I am I guess you can say a very hardcore STEM person. And then yeah. from physics, I had some exposure to computer science. And this is like going way, way, way back when computer science wasn't a, a degree in itself in my college. And then I went on to um, do my master's and, uh, and then eventually PhD in the area. So mm -hmm. I like, you know, I think anyone, you both are programmers or you have written programs. Anyone who's ever written a program, the power of creating something when you get the errors and you fix it and it actually works, there is a eureka moment. I don't know if you both have felt that, but I yes. think, um, <laughs> uh, you know, working working in the programming realm from early on, I think I, I caught that bug. I caught the bug of creating and hence uh, was my journey of uh, writing code and then getting more and more into computer science when, in the various disciplines of it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, as as soon as as soon as you mentioned um, writing code and it not work, and then finally, to, <laughs> man, I, I can't tell you, I can't tell you how good that feels. But I did not. You, just, you did physics first, and then went into Komsai. Yeah, I did. No, meaning it, my major was physics, but I did do a minor in computer science. Oh. oh. You yeah, you sound like a hardcore, hardcore STEM person. Cause, like, <laughs> I don't no. remember any physics, so don't even go there. <laughs> no. even I remember so, no even physics. Even <laughs> That's so. a disclaimer. Even so, like physics is such a hardcore science. So, like people fear, like people hear physics and they start tremble. You know, and you know, say you right. That's you did physics and comsci. That's that's crazy. That is crazy. So you've always been into the sciences ever since you were younger. Yes, yes. And although, you know, it's funny, um, but my children, well, my younger son is not so much into sciences, but I encouraged him. Well, he didn't have an option until CSEC. He had to do sciences and then do whatever you want. And I think he still thanks me for it. When he sees people around him who's, who understand very little science around him, he's like, he says, OK, I'm going to force my children to do sciences till CSEC. So I think I have made, managed to pass that along. So even though they may not have gone full into sciences, at least that appreciation is there, that studying science is very important till a particular age where you can build your foundations. Yeah, I agree. Because I think um, studying any science, especially math, home science, physics, they, they give you a certain level of critical thinking that you don't find in in other in other subjects. You know? Not that those other things aren't important, but STEM fields that you develop a part of where I don't think can be developed in other areas. I, you know, it's funny. We are we are all from the STEM field, and hence we can say that. But I'll give you a flip side to it. My eldest my elder son was more into sciences, and I was talking to a friend who's a lawyer, and he encouraged me to encourage him to take history. And my son did take history in the end because he said history has so much analysis. And yeah. as a STEM person, I don't think of history as a subject having analysis, but that was his take on it. And he said, you know, STEM people really need to do things like um, history, which keeps which keeps them rooted to some um, analysis from another perspective. So I think yeah. we are biased, but I think there are other people who would disagree with that thought process and say that there are you know, other subjects which also teach you that analytical thinking or connecting the dots and you can see why in history connecting dots would also be critical yeah i mean no you make a very good point because i do some philosophy courses and you know like comparing philosophy to science it's like it's like the same thing but from two different perspectives one is the whole one is, one is the why so why I, yeah one, one is the why so they kind of they kind of Make you think differently, but it's. I think it's important to think differently because I think that was that's one of the most important things in doing the sciences. Thinking differently, thinking different from who we did this way. Thinking because being a com science student, you can understand that everyone codes are right, their codes differently, they interpret the problem differently, and they approach it differently. 
Absolutely, absolutely. I'm. I agree with you there. And you know, the the, the truth is, why are we why are we suffering in STEM in the Caribbean? Why are students not getting into Carib in 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 this field? And then more and more, uh, you know, I think you wanted to speak about the gender inequality in STEM in the Caribbean or in the university. It worries me. Like you know, first time I remember when there was girls in ICT day, my initial reaction was, you know. Why do we need to have a girls in ICT day? But then I thought about it in the, in the analytical manner, and I said that if 70% of the university population is females, um, sciences and computing, which is my discipline, is one of the most um, you know jobs of the future. That's where the jobs are going to be. So if 70% of the university population we are scoping out from that, we are in trouble. So to get more and more people employed in this field, to be able to you know fill the labor market in this domain, we need both the genders to be equally engaged, if not more. And yeah. hence, that that's where it becomes important. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And you know, when I mentioned um, the girls in ICT, as, as need, it, it's it's so strange to know that we even need that because it should have been equal from day one. Like we shouldn't have had this bias against against women in 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 stem but you know as a, as a brother that i asked daniel i asked my this question earlier and and i know that women feel this problem a lot especially women in stem and leadership um has there ever been a situation in which your authority was questioned because of your gender and how did you deal with that situation i um you know i have actually never encountered that as yet so really yeah, I haven't encountered it. I've been at UE my, uh, you know, my my academic life, and yeah. uh, my department. Uh, well, right now uh, we are three females. There are, I think, eleven academics, and of which three of us are females. But a few years ago, I think I was the only one, and the other two have come recently. But it has been, um, <coughs> I think, the the males in computer science are very much logical minded people. So it doesn't yeah. matter who the person is. If I, you know, I, I think I know that people, other people have encountered this, but I must yeah. say that in my field, I have not encountered it, um, uh, which, which is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. You know, a lot of people we hear them say, "Oh, they chose him over me because he's a guy, and they expect him to to be better than me." But you know, if if I was to even put things in context, Romario, I'm also the head of the department, and I, I don't think I don't think I see myself as a I, th I don't think my colleagues see me as a female head of the department. They just see me as a colleague, Gunjan um, Mansing, as head of the department or you know in the leadership role. And I think all of us have our positives, be it males and females, and we just need to bring those um, when we are doing a job. And but I, yeah. you know. It, our, the truth meaning it's our gender bal imbalance is not so much as compared to the rest of the world. I think the rest of the world suffers from 70 to 30, you know, 70 percent being male. But I think in computing, we have a at UE, we have a 60, 40, 60 percent males and 40 percent females, whereas yeah. the university population is 70 percent females and 30 percent males. So. Yeah. I think we are we are, and, and you know girls have done well. We have had top top. We have we have a top student award, and um, many years we have uh, females who get that award. So it's I think we have a balance here, yeah. uh, compared to the rest of the world. Yeah, I think which so. is I, rare. Yeah, because uh, in our country like Jamaica, where there are certain stereotypes against so when you would you you wouldn't expect that in the school system. But yeah, I mean, I said this to. To Daniel and my before, the brightest people I know at UA are females. The smartest <laughs> people I know are females, you know. So, um, you know, I, I don't want to say it's strange, but it's it, it is quite surprising to, to see that because of all the stereotypes and, and so that are, are put against females. But I think it's good that you've never, never experienced that. Um, no, I haven't experienced it, and I hope I, I hope I never do experience it. And I want to feel that where I've reached is because of my own capability, rather than just because of my, you know, pe because people see gender as an issue. And if I get promoted, I will see that as a, if I may say, say it in a in a slang language, a diss to me. 
um, <laughs> that I get, I, I get somewhere because of my, you know, who I am and not because of what I know and what my capabilities are. Yeah. And I, th- you know, I really think it's such a bad approach for men and some women do this too. So, look at someone and assume something because of their gender. I think it's such a terrible mindset to come from. And not even just in, in, in terms of school and STEM, but there are other parts of life to where we have this thing where we say, oh, you're a girl, so you can't do this, or you're a, you're a male, so you can't do this. And I really Absolutely. feel like... Absolutely. Really feel... And you know, as I said, um, there, you said there are three females in your department. No, I, I do feel as if if that stereotype was not there from the beginning, you would have more females in that department now. Yeah, you're, you're probably right. Uh, because I do see that, uh, in the, you know, when it becomes um, heavier, you know, jobs uh, more into the industry, um, you know, the females tend to taper off and go, um, you know, as, as the life progresses, I think they tend to um, take uh, a little backseat in the career. Because one thing about technology, not so much about STEM, but I think technology is that you really have to keep on your toes. Yeah. And when your other responsibilities of life come in, and I think in, in life, um, if I may say so, without someone massacring me, that females do have a bigger role to play in in relationships and in families and in, you know, in taking care of the children, there are responsibilities which, which by physically we have to deal with. And, yeah. and sometimes you can get antiquated. So it is a field where you can become a dinosaur very quickly. And uh, hence, you can't take a break that you can take in other disciplines and still feel that you're on top. Yeah. So I think uh, that dissuades them also from being in this field. Yeah, as you talk about family, like, is it not, is it not a lot of pressure on you? Like, how do you manage? Uh, uh, the- <laughs> I am not managing very well just now. but uh, <laughs> Because right now with COVID, what I find is that... Uh, the work and uh, home uh, life lines are blurred uh, because, you know, we are working, all of us are working from home. So these lines that are blurred and I think some things that females are very bad at doing, which is what I've heard from others. And then yeah. this person actually said it to me. We are bad at saying we cannot say no easily. So it's like if you ask me for the interview, I could never say no. I have to come and do it. Like, you know, it's like, I don't know if any, uh, somebody else would say, no, I don't have the time. I will find that time. And, and hence that inability to say no during this time, I'm finding it very hard to cope with everything. It's, I won't lie. I am finding it hard. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, I expect that too because, you know, uh, this, is, this is kind of a new way of life for yeah. everyone. I, everyone yeah. has to. Everyone kind of has to be finding different methods and, and stuff. But one, you have your family at home now. So all of a sudden, you have all these responsibilities that you never had before. And now you have to look after children when usually they'd be at school. And you have work to do as well. And I would imagine, I would imagine, but um, hopefully we're out of this. My children are your age, so I'm okay. That's why I'm okay just now. Oh, oh. Are they, are they female as well? No, males, males. What? Because males. Now you know that. Now you know that. We don't have that perfect at four right now. You know, so I said, I can't. We don't. You raise them well if they're not giving any issue. You know? Well, I hope so. They, they, I hope they're raised well if they're listening to me. <laughs> I know that I have my, my times. I have my times. Um. There's supposed to be a critic giveaway right now. Uh, let me just start. So, sure. Um, in the meantime, you can just um tell us about um why you love the STEM field, Miss Doctor Manson. Oh, she she's oh she's gone. Oh, her Wi Fi checked out. Oh, oh no worries. So, credit giveaway, sir. Yeah, apologies for that. Dr. Man Singh's Wi Fi just went. All right, yeah, I'm just saw this out. Um, 
in the meantime, I'm starting this out now to you quickly. Oh, yeah. Um, Daniel. Kicked out. I got kicked you, out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I was saying, um, in the meantime, while, while I start this out, just, um, kind of go in more about your passion. Like, why did you go into the STEM field? And then, furthermore, why did you become a lecturer at the UWI? And how did you reach the, like, head of department? I think you're muted. Yeah, I'm not hearing anything. No. Uh, Maya, can you check if, if it's muted from the stream yard side? I'm going to actually get kicked out again. Daniel, you can't hear me, right? Yeah, yeah sorry, Dr. Mansing is having a little bit of issues with her internet. Um, okay. I'm going to try adding her one more time. No problem. Thanks, Maya. You can hear me, right? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good to go. Every time I touch something on the screen, I get knocked out. So I will try not to touch anything on the screen. <laughs> no problem. Um, you were asking a question in terms of, uh, I did both my master's, my research, my MPhil and PhD here on, uh, at UE. So I'm very much a UV product. I started off as a research student and then I have become, I became a lecturer, a senior lecturer. And then eventually when there was, <clears throat> sorry, I've been talking too much while teaching and my voice goes during that time. But um, I have, uh, and then eventually when there was a post for, you know, a head of the department is actually just a post that it gets rotated amongst all the colleagues. Oh. <coughs> so... When the role came up, I was happy to take it on because I, I know it from various angles, from a student perspective to a junior, you know, academic out there and then taking on the senior role. So um, I was happy to take it on So and to see that how I can, something that I felt that was important. I think I have, uh, you know, skills of uh, networking and relationships. So I've been using those skills to bring visibility to my department. I think we in the department tend to be very mild mannered and we let others take uh, bigger roles. You know, there are people who who just use technology and talk about technology, whereas people who create technology don't often end up talking about it. So mm. I felt strongly about it that, you know, there are people who just know something about it and they are bigger microphones. You know, they speak, they, they are seen as the experts versus us in the department. So my objective has been to really create that, uh, uh, that visibility for the Department of Computing here at UWE so that people understand what we are capable of because our students are our biggest assets and they are doing so well. They are my, you know, the biggest, um, they are my biggest asset. And I wouldn't say just mine. I think everyone, all of us in the department feel really proud of them, what they are achieving. There's a great demand for this discipline. And, uh, and I think we are, we are there shoulder to shoulder with what is happening in the world. So we feel proud about the product that we are creating. And because I have seen, I've been there for so long, right from a postgrad student. And even as a postgrad student, you know, the admin staff always treated me as, as if I was a staff member there. I was treated special. So I try yeah. and create, keep that culture going so that even my postgrad students and students feel that way, that they all belong. You know, sense of belonging is very critical. And when people have a sense of belonging, they... can you just call Prerna and tell her? Sorry, my phone was um, uh, tech issues. So I think when you keep uh, people, you create the sense no. of belonging for people, then it is um, much it creates a different environment for them. And getting that right environment is very important for a workplace. You know, me, me, um, Dr. Mansing, as I talked about with students, I'm here looking at Daniel saying, this is one right, this is one right here, you know, from, from that department. Come to look, Dr. Mansing, everybody. You... Go ahead, sorry, I'm listening. I'm saying, this morning's right here, the girl, but you're about to be putting on thing, man. Like, no, to be honest, I'm very impressed by by Miss Mornings, you know, because it's not often you see someone come around with her level of talent, charisma, and intellect, and you know, even as as a as a female, 
you know, from what society tells you, you know, I say, no, girl, now go to them thing. Like, it's very impressive to see. It's very impressive to see. And ever since last year, um, I've been hearing about Miss Puddings, you know, I've always been impressed. <laughs> well, same here. <laughs> <you're doing> <laughs> <you're doing> <clears throat> Um, all right, yeah, we have a credit giveaway, and I have a question. So, whoever can answer the question first, I think it's from our YouTube comments or, or from our Twitter handle. Whoever can answer correctly first, you will win $500 credit. So the question is What is the Male to female ratio of students at the University of the West Indies. You can go ahead and comment down below. Yeah. I think I think um I think Maya should handle who wins because I don't have access to it right now. Sorry. So she, she will either tell me who wins and then I say the whole life here and then or she can do. I hope I give the right stats when I gave them. <laughs> I hope it's not fake news that I'm giving. <laughs> I you know that's something we fear about nowadays, but I think I'm on the right track. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but if I had to guess, wait, no, let me not guess. I don't want to say, wait, what, what's anything like? Maya, your mic. So the student who got it correct first is none other than Miss Tahira Robinson. Congratulations, Tahira. Oh, she, she said 30 to 70%. Yeah. So that's 30% meals to 70% email. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's about it. Yes. Thirty percent meals to. Wow. Like, all right. Let me ask you, um, Doctor Wansi, is is that of, is that concerning to you to see like to see that ratio? Yes, it is. And I think when, you know, this email had been sent to me about this call, I was like saying that, uh, yes, we do have a gender imbalance. And I think we need to also focus on why, where are the males going? Because uh, if our females become more educated, I think that's, that is a big issue that the males need to be there hand in hand with them. Otherwise, there will be an imbalance in the society. So... Yeah. My issue is that, you know, if the males are only 30% coming into universities and if, if this is a discipline which attracts males, then this, you're in trouble anyway. So one has to be very, very, um, you know, you have to make effort to ensure that both males and females are coming into this discipline. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really important that we as men we step up and start take these things serious, you know, education and all uh, these stuff because... Yeah. Um. So, last question before we close up. Um, if you could go back in time, or if you could go on some grand stage and talk to your younger self, or talk to young girls who are looking, or for a future in STEM, what would you tell them? Um. Okay. You know, I would tell them that do what you like doing and ensure that they are being exposed to all the aspects of STEM. So that, you know, you have to, you have to teach it in a particular way that they develop that liking. I think, uh, I think people always have, should do what they like in life because then only they will be successful. So I just, I, what I would do is to ensure, like, you know, the, how that curriculum gets taught, it's done in a fun manner versus, because we can't do the fun manner in university. It's too late at this point. You know, I can't spend time in having, uh, sometimes I do the quizzes and I do this and I realize, oh my God, I've spent so much time on the fun. So maybe, maybe the entire way we teach right from primary schools to uh, universities has to be seen together in one flow. So I would look at that, especially for technology. I think 
trying to go into high schools where students are doing the CAPE or CSEC and say, hey, do this discipline, I think that's too late. I think we have to catch them early. We have to give them that, uh, that, that, that fun aspect of creating from early so that they say that, oh, this is where I want to go. Uh, you know, I want to be someone who is going to be working at Google and Apple or any of these big tech companies. Um, and that, that's where they want to be. Or we, we create those equivalent companies in Jamaica. And, and we, you know, we, so we build a vibrant industry out here. So I, I think that whole revamping, and I'm happy that people like Daniel and you are in this field with, with strong voices, and maybe you will help make that change. So I agree with you, Dr. Mansing, because when I first started loving computer science was again from, from prep school, so probably from about six, seven there about. I remember we had computer class and when we started out with was they had buzzers and we we're supposed to go and press the buzzer with the correct answer and then they leveled us up to mouses and so on and so forth. Um, and I used to challenge my teacher, I used to come to class and say, Miss, you can't teach me this before I learn it on my own. And so we'd have that little banter every week going back and forth, can't you teach it first or so on. Um, so I think you do really have to catch people from there on. And I've seen a lot of persons from my prep school then go on to continue in computer science later on. Um, and when we started high school, we had such a wealth of knowledge with computer systems that many others didn't have. So I think that could possibly be a model to look into. How do you make it fun from the get-go and from the start? And not only for computer science, but for physics. Um, experiments yes. and so on are very exciting. You know, certain ones that will just explode or... You know, the one with the $50 that you can, you can burn it, but you put ethanol on top of it, et cetera. Like, there's so many different cool things that we can yeah. do in order to introduce young, young, young children to it. So I think definitely a revamping of the, the curriculum and looking at how we channel students in. I know the, the ministry, our heart trust as well, have started like specific coding, um, you know, courses, or maybe they'll create a STEM high school or something. There are talks of all of these different things, which I think could be beneficial in actually creating more STEM students. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, we have to, we have to look at it in, in a total ecosystem aspect versus just, um, you know, just get, getting more to students into the discipline. Yeah. Most, most, most STEM graduates will get a good job. That's, that's the bottom line. Yeah, that's what um, I realized. So it's, it's, it's lucrative if that's what, you know, if that is one of the uh, motivating features, but it will only be lucrative. You'll only do well in it if you like it. Yeah. If you try and do it because you think it'll, it'll make you money, I don't think you're going far with that. True. <laughs> yeah, you have to love it. You have to love it. I remember I had um, one specific teacher and just, just because he seemed like he really loved math and physics, you know, it just kind of, it was almost kind of infectious. Uh, it was uh, his energy and love was kind of infectious, and it kind of just made you want to continue to do it. And I want, I want to be honest, it, it's not really there as when it was then. You know, it kind of wore off. But man, I, I really wish I, I spent more time, and you should spend time around people who share the same passions as you, because you know you can just kind of feed off of each other's energies and keep on discussing certain things and on one right. Yeah. And you know that, and I, what I would tell the young people is that there are two types of people. There are some people who know exactly what they want to do from early on in life. And there is one group of people who should explore everything and then go on to do what they want in life later on. So, you, you know, sometimes people get frightened by looking at the other group and say, but they know exactly what they want to do. And maybe I should also go and do that. I think that's, that's where the fear and the danger comes in, because everybody wants to then end up becoming a doctor or doing actuarial science because you know that's that's where everyone is going versus trying to even imagine what else you could do with your life yeah. um, so it's been great talking to you both you know um thank you very much dr mansing I, I must say it was quite a pleasure even though this is the first time meeting you um i would really love to see myself in even though i don't have a lot of time left at you, yeah, really love to be in one of your classes. Um, Daniel, thanks you, for me. Are you in final year? Um, no, I'm, um, are you? no, final year would be next year for me. Okay, so I think I'll probably see you. You'll probably end up doing some of our core courses in third year. Yeah, hopefully, so yeah, I'll, yeah, I should be. So I'll see you uh, in the AI course. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Mansing. 
Thank um, you, guys. Thank you, Daniel. Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Mario. Daniel, Maya, you're not here, but thanks. Um, everyone watching, thank you so much for... Shania Thompson um, is also... She worked on this very, very hard, you know, putting everything oh, together. So big up Shania as well. Big up yourself, Shania. Big up everybody I watch. Um, yeah, thanks so much for watching. And in the next episode, we'll be talking about um, privacy in the digital age. So make sure to come on and tune in for that one. And... Okay. What's that, can you Martin? can you can you advertise two movies for them to go and watch before they come and watch that show of yours? <laughs> sure, they need to go. They need to watch uh, Social Dilemma, and they need yeah. to watch The Great Hack. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Before you before you come online, you need to, you need to watch those movies. You need to watch those. Like, I remember, <laughs> yes. No, because I, I watch both of them, and they just change your perspective on how social media is and, and privacy and all that stuff. Yeah. Yes, very much so. You need to watch what so, Um yeah. anyway. It's, it's, okay. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.